Thank you very much to Hunter Killer for sponsoring this video. We've all been there. There's a chill in the air outside, and bundling up in front of an autumnal fire sounds spellbinding. You settle on the couch and wonder what could be the focus for your next stay at home adventure. You've already finished all of the true crime documentaries and mystery shows, so where do you turn to now? Well, how about a subscription-based interactive murder mystery game delivered right to your doorstep that pulls you into a crime scene where you are the detective? Hunter Killer takes your favorite crime show or mystery thriller and makes you the central character, providing a plethora of clues, codes, and ciphers to crack along your sleuthing journey. Be it by yourself or with a team, no night in is complete without a murder mystery keeping everyone on their toes as you search for the killer. Even if the party is digital, hop on Zoom and investigate your library of case files provided in each subscription box, full of detailed characters with immersive backgrounds and storytelling unmatched in any other true crime medium. For just the price of a trip to the cinema, you can ditch the babysitter and stay at home for the sleuthing experience you've always dreamed of. Here at CCD, we especially appreciate the community-driven aspects of Hunter Killer. Over 100,000 fans have come together to form an energetic online and spoiler-free collective to discuss those cases you can't quite crack alone, or just to hang out and talk about all things true crime. To join this exclusive crime-chasing community, our viewers can go to hunterkiller.com forward slash coldcasedetective and use the code CCD for 20% off your first box. Again, use CCD to get a 20% discount and show your support for the channel. Your incredible support makes everything we do here possible, so grab a bottle of wine and a magnifying glass and join us to hunt a killer. Arkansas, the US state home to over three million people, looks almost utopian in its photos which clearly showcase some of the most beautiful landscapes that America has to offer. Filled with stunning mountains, gleaming rivers, and beautiful hot springs, its hiking trails are a nature lover's dream. But like any seemingly perfect location, it has its dark side. In today's episode of Cold Case Detective, we'll be examining two of Arkansas's most famous unsolved criminal cases. Morgan Nick Born on September 12, 1988, Morgan Nick was a bright, warm, and loving little girl hailing from Ozark in Arkansas. Her parents described her as a shy girl on the quiet side who loved cats, and in 1995, she adopted her first kitten from the local shelter, whom she named Emily. The pair were inseparable, with Emily even sleeping at night next to her six-year-old owner. The eldest of three children, Morgan became an active member of the Girl Scouts, particularly enjoying various indoor activities. She wasn't entirely sure what she was going to do when she grew up, often bouncing between being a circus performer and a doctor, or maybe as she often considered, even both. No one could possibly have predicted that little Morgan Nick wouldn't have a chance to realize those dreams. At 9pm on the night of June 9th, 1995, Morgan and her mother, Colleen, attended a Little League baseball game in Alma after a family friend invited them down. Towards the end of the game, at around 10.30pm, the six-year-old became restless. When two of her friends came over and asked if she wanted to catch fireflies with them, she eagerly asked her mother, who said no. But Colleen eventually relented, frequently looking over to check on the children as they played nearby. 15 minutes later, at 10.45 p.m., the game ended. Colleen spotted the two children who'd been playing with Morgan, but not the little girl herself. The children said she was emptying the sand from her shoes over at Colleen's car, a Nissan Stanza. This was the last time that Morgan was seen alive, as when her mother approached the car, she found her daughter missing. 
Terrified, Colleen spoke to the local coaches, who questioned the other children further. They remembered seeing a man they described as creepy watching them earlier on, explaining that he was with a red pickup truck. They said that he'd spoken to Morgan earlier. The car was seen leaving at around the time the six-year-old was last seen. When the police arrived on the scene, a huge manhunt for the missing girl was launched. Around 300 people were in attendance at the Little League game, which helped to provide police with multiple witnesses, some who saw the man, and some who saw Morgan at her mother's car. The children told authorities that the unidentified man had spoken to them all and asked them questions, but the nature of this conversation has never been released to the public. The FBI quickly got involved with the case, providing resources and manpower to the Alma Police Department. A sketch and description of the unknown man was released. In 1995, he was described as being between 23 and 38 years old, six foot tall and 180 pounds. He was wearing blue denim shorts, no shirt or shoes, and had black or salt and pepper hair. He is also noted to have had a quote, hillbilly accent, combed back hair that could possibly have been curly with a mustache, three or four days of beard growth and a hairy chest. His car was described as being a dull red older pickup truck with a white camper shell and rear damage on the passenger side. It is believed to have had Arkansas plates. His composite sketch resulted in over 4,000 tips. Morgan's disappearance is thought to have been linked with two other attempted abductions around the same time. On the morning of June 9th, a four-year-old was pulled into a truck outside of a laundromat, but her mother managed to get her back. Then on June 10th, a nine-year-old was forced into a men's restroom at a convenience store in Fort Smith, 10 miles away. Luckily, the girl was able to escape, in both cases, the reported abductor and his vehicle were described as being similar to those in Morgan's case. Fortunately, police have not been short of leads, and there have been countless sightings of Morgan across the US. However, law enforcement has had no luck in locating the young girl or identifying her abductor. Even two decades later, Morgan's case continues to receive tips on a regular basis, something which the Alma police have noted is rare in older cases. On January 5th, 2002, police received a tip that was so specific they felt they had to investigate. It indicated that Morgan was buried in an area of private land in Boonville. They also used a dog in the search, but when it ended at 9.30 p.m., police decided not to return, having recovered nothing from the site. Then in November of 2010, Federal investigators searched a vacant house in Spiro, Oklahoma, looking for DNA evidence that could show Morgan was once inside the house. The following month, they returned to this location to conduct a further search after receiving a tip. Cadavir dogs alerted them to a well on the property, which was the center of the investigation, but no evidence of Morgan's presence was ever found and the search was eventually called off. Then in August of 2012, two previously convicted felons, Tonya Smith and James Monhart, were arrested for computer fraud after attempting to utilize the six-year-old's identity. They are not believed to have had any connection to the case, however. The most recent update to Morgan's case came in 2017, when a property was searched for any sign of her. The property belonged to a man who'd been a person of interest in the disappearance since the very beginning. He is reportedly now in jail on unrelated charges, but refuses to discuss the missing girl. If Morgan is still alive, she would be 32 years old. A docu-series about her disappearance is currently in the works. Her parents continue to hope that one day she will come home. Anyone with any information pertaining to Morgan's disappearance can call the Alma PD on 479-632-3333. Don Henry and Kevin Ives. On August 23rd, 1987, at approximately four o'clock in the morning, the engineer on board a 75 car Union Pacific locomotive en route to Little Rock, Arkansas, spotted two bodies, motionless, lying on the tracks. The horn was blared, but the bodies didn't stir. 
The train was moving at over 50 miles per hour, and while the emergency brake was used, there was no way it could stop in time before it hit the bodies. At 4.40 AM, the local police department arrived on the gruesome scene. The bodies were soon identified as 16-year-old Don Henry and 17-year-old Kevin Ives. The pair were best friends and popular seniors at Bryant High School. They had gone out hunting late that night. A torch and a rifle were found with the bodies. It is believed they were participating in what's known as the spotlighting method of hunting, which involves blinding prey before shooting. Interestingly, many of the witnesses on board the train claimed the boys were partially covered with green tarp, but the police never found a trace of it at the scene. The train's engineer claimed he'd told authorities about the tarp, while they later claimed that he hadn't. This was just the beginning of a long list of discrepancies in what is widely considered to be a botched investigation by the Saline County Sheriff's Department. The state medical examiner, a man named Dr. Malik, ruled the deaths of Kevin and Don as an accident that likely occurred because they had consumed so much marijuana. He claimed that they had smoked the equivalent of 20 marijuana cigarettes and then fallen asleep on the tracks. However, the parents of both boys were not convinced, finding it hard to believe that they'd lie down side by side in the same position or that they could simply sleep through the sound of a train and its horn. They hired their own private investigator to do some digging, but he was met with resistance as he attempted to uncover what was really going on. Curiously, the PI found that the hospital that the boys had been taken to had no record of their presence, and that the staff of Dr. Malik had accused him before of falsifying autopsy records. He also found notes from the emergency responders who'd arrived on the scene that night that described how the blood of the two boys looked like it lacked oxygen, which raised questions about whether they were already dead when the train hit. In March of 1988, Dr. James Garriott of San Antonio offered a second opinion, stating that he was skeptical about the initial findings. He claimed that the only reliable way of testing for drugs was via mass spectrometry, a process which had not been carried out by Dr. Malik during the initial autopsy. The Saline County Sheriff at the time, a man named James Steed Jr., claimed there was no evidence to suggest that the boys' deaths had been anything other than an accident. In a letter which was published in the Benton Courier, Linda Ives, the mother of Kevin, heavily criticized the sheriff's department for their handling of the investigation. In response to this, in February of 1988, Sheriff Steed made a deal with Dan Harmon, the lawyer who was representing the parents of both Kevin and Don. If the parents withdrew their criticism of the sheriff's department, they would see to it that a proper investigation was launched into the boys' deaths. The second autopsy was carried out by Georgia medical examiner, Dr. Joseph Burton. He found the equivalent of between one and three marijuana cigarettes in the boys' systems combined, a far cry from Dr. Malik's initial estimation of around 20. Don's shirt had evidence of stab wounds to its back, while Kevin's skull appeared to have been crushed, likely by the butt of his own rifle. As a result, the grand jury ruled the deaths as definite homicide. But despite this, Sheriff Steed refused to put money into the investigation. He was also found to have lied about where he sent the boy's clothing so it could be tested. It was meant to have been sent to the FBI, but instead, he sent it to the Arkansas State Crime Lab. It was no surprise to anybody that, following his poor handling of the case, James Steed Jr. was not re-elected for sheriff. In the days following this defeat, one of Dan Harmon's informants, who was asked to take aerial photographs of the scene by Harmon, was murdered. This was just one in a long string of murders possibly connected to the case. Four men who had been called to testify before the grand jury were found dead, either from murder or suspicious accidents, while another one disappeared. At least three of these men had links to the drug underworld of Arkansas. Due to the bungled investigation, there are not many suspects in the case of Kevin Ives and Don Henry. One week before the pair passed away, a man wearing military fatigues was spotted not far from the train tracks. When a police officer approached him, the man opened fire before disappearing into the night. On the night that the boys were found on the tracks, a similar looking man wearing the same kind of clothing was spotted nearby. 
This man has never been identified and it is unknown if he has any connection to the case. There was one local witness who did come forward with information possibly pertaining to the case. On the night of the boys' slayings, the witness saw two police officers beating two boys senseless in a store parking lot before tossing them into a truck and driving away. It's unknown if these boys were Don and Kevin or whether they had any connection to the case at all. Linda Ives, Kevin's mother who has been extremely outspoken throughout the investigation, has stated her belief that the deaths are linked to drug trafficking. This theory involves the boys stumbling upon a drug drop from an aeroplane, suggesting that the boys were killed for stumbling upon something that they shouldn't have. A prosecutor named Richard Garrett, who had the bodies exhumed for a second autopsy, suspected this theory to be true. He claimed there was a lot of drug trafficking through the city of Bryant, which is connected to several other states. He has also stated his belief that a police cover-up has taken place in regards to the case of Kevin and Don. Then on June 25th, 1984, two young men in Hogden, Oklahoma were also run over by a train. Billy Don Hainline, 21, and Dennis Decker, 26, were found lying on the tracks side by side. While there was a small amount of alcohol in their systems, it was nowhere near enough to cause them to pass out. Their deaths have also been ruled as an accident. One month later, a meth lab was found about a mile and a half from where the bodies were located. While this case was eventually reopened, no evidence of any foul play was found, and the official conclusion remains that they fell asleep on the tracks. Although this case may have nothing to do with that of Henry and Don, it shares eerie similarities nonetheless. In 1994, a video called The Clinton Chronicles was released, linking Bill Clinton to various crimes, including the deaths of Kevin and Don. The film propelled forward conspiracy theories, which involved Clinton allegedly using the Mena Intermountain Municipal Airport to smuggle drugs, guns, and money from Central America. Two years later, in 1996, Linda Ives was involved in a film named Obstruction of Justice, which detailed the fumbled investigation and cover-up of an alleged drug ring in Saline County. The video also named some people who were possibly implicit in this alleged cover-up. A year later, in 1997, Dan Harmon was convicted of racketeering, conspiracy, extortion, and drug possession with intent to distribute and was sentenced to 11 years in prison. Tragically, in recent years, things have not improved for Linda or the other family members of Don and Kevin. In 2016, Linda filed a lawsuit citing a violation of the Freedom of Information Act by local, state, and federal authorities. She accused them of refusing to meet the record requests she had filed pertaining to the boy's case and added that the documents she had been given were so heavily redacted that she couldn't make sense of them. However, her case was thrown out in 2019. The most recent development came in 2018, when a former pro wrestler named Billy Jack Haynes came forward to say that he had witnessed the executions. He claimed that Don and Kevin were slain after stumbling upon a drug deal involving corrupt police and high-level US politicians, adding that he was once involved in a cocaine smuggling network that stretched back to the Medellin cartel. According to Haynes, he was there to provide muscle during a drug drop, and while he denies having any part of the executions themselves, he says he helped to move and dump the bodies. Several of the people named in his confession were either murdered or convicted on drugs charges. Although this account has given hope to some, many find Haynes' confession to be unreliable. The former wrestler is notorious for inserting himself into situations and peddling conspiracy theories. He has, on multiple occasions, claimed that he knew the truth behind other deaths, including that of James Michael Frank, a judge and director of the New Mexico Corrections Department who was slain in 1989. As a result, many people do not find Haynes to be a credible witness. Although the case aired on the well-known TV show Unsolved Mysteries in 1988, and although a book was written about it by an investigative journalist named Mara Leverett, the deaths of John and Kevin have largely fallen from the public eye. To this day, their families still search for justice, and the murders of Don Henry and Kevin Ives remain unsolved. 
And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. If you're still hungry for true crime content, you can also check out the Cold Case Detective podcast by following the link below. Thank you for watching, stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.